Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Monday, April 7th, 2014. And what a program we have for you today. What a story we have. What an insightful story we have. Courtesy of our guest, Yuri Maltsev. Yuri Maltsev defected to the United States from the Soviet Union in 1989. He had been an advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev's government. And what a story it is. And it's not just the story. Also, we're going to talk about life in the Soviet Union, things that we just can't ever be allowed to forget. Yuri Maltsev right now is a professor of economics at Carthage College in Wisconsin. He's the editor of a book called Requiem for Marx, and more recently, he's co-author of a book called The Tea Party Explained. Yuri, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Now, Yuri, I know you are probably tired, beyond tired, of telling the story about defecting from the Soviet Union. But I'm sorry, you're going to have to tell it one more time, because, number one, I never tire of hearing it. And number two, most of my audience has probably not heard your story. And it's interesting also because since a lot of my audience is young, I bet some of them don't know what a defector is. Remember when you and I were on Glenn Beck that time and half his staff was under age 25, they didn't know what it meant to defect. So we were living in such a different world. We were all marveling at that at the time. But I would love to hear this story. And then we'll go back and talk about your life in the Soviet Union and your observations there. But let's start with this exciting story from 1989, which meant you must have been one of the last defectors. Uh, that's probably right. Yes, yes. Uh, I, um, uh, Tom, I don't like the word to defect. To defect means that you're giving up something you believed in, which I never believed in. And um, but the defect for me was to move from from the uh, from the ultimate tyranny of the Soviet Union to kind of a mild tyranny of the United States. And I was dreaming of doing that uh, even before I was um, in 1970s. I was an exchange student in United Kingdom. Uh, well, I I, uh, I think that's an oxymoron, an exchange student. I don't think anyone was exchanged for me, but. I was dreaming of doing that, and I wouldn't because my father was alive, and at that time, Soviets were so so so, so bad, and uh, and uh, they were the plan of atrocious measures. In 1989, uh, already the uh, because of Perestroika, because of Mr. Gorbachev, he removed fear out of that system, glued together only by fear. Then I thought that the the time is time is good, but it happened completely. In, uh, uh, completely unexpected to me, because I uh, went on a business trip to Finland um, when I was uh, uh, mostly explaining um, the Finns and other Scandinavians uh, what Perestroika is all about. Uh, so I had public lectures in the Helsinki School of Economics and the Ministry of Finance of, of Finland and other places. And I was not planning to defect because Finns at that time uh, still were under Moscow control. And if I would try to uh, I could end up in eastern Siberia uh, for 12 years of hard labor. Even under Gorbachev, they would give these kind of sentences to people who would like to leave the Soviet Union. Uh, so I was not prepared for this kind of career change and uh, was not planning to defect. And uh, uh, while in Finland, however, um, uh, I uh, was buying uh, a lot of stuff for my friends because uh, when uh, when everybody found out that I am going to Finland, which was also considered to be kind of like a huge and wonderful supermarket next door, because they had everything, while Soviets didn't have anything at that time under Perestroika, everything disappeared. Uh, there was nothing to buy in the stores, and um, and so I was I got a lot of requests uh, uh, to buy stuff for 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 my friends whom I left behind. And um, and amazingly enough, uh, uh, most um, females they asked either for mascara or lipstick or both, and most uh, men uh, they ask only for one thing, and that would be condoms. And why condoms? Because in Soviet Union at that time, uh, the the Soviet government was spreading rumors that AIDS was developed by the U.S. Army base in Fort Detrick, Maryland, to kill Russians. And so uh, 
uh, there was a real AIDS scare in the USSR. And so because of that, uh, everybody was looking uh, to protect themselves from HIV virus. And so I was buying all this stuff, and I was not planning to defect. I was uh, planning to return back and, and, and give uh, my friends what they want. Uh, but then I heard uh, kind of like a bad day. Uh, began with an interview with the Swedish uh, television, uh, and uh, and the lady um, in charge, she said, well, you were so critical of Mr. Gorbachev, but we love him in Scandinavia. Well, I replied that I said, well, uh, if you love him, we can sell him for a reasonable amount of margarine, <laughs> of sausage, of flour, of washing detergent. <laughs> and, and she, she uh, unlike yourself, she didn't laugh. She was uh, very uh, looked at me very soberly, somberly, and, and uh, didn't like what I said. And when I returned back to my hotel, was a message to call uh, certain Pavlenko, and I called them, and that turned out to be a, to be um, a attaché, press attaché of the Soviet embassy in Helsinki, and he was shouting at me, saying that you are in no position to sell anyone for anything, and we will talk about that in Moscow. So I had some had some kind of like a pretty bad aftertaste. Um, and then the same day, I had a, 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 a lecture at the Ministry of Finance of Finland, and, um, uh, and then uh, during the lecture, I saw that they were serving nice food in a adjacent room, so I thought, wonderful, I will eat here, I will save money on my dinner, and uh, I will buy more uh, for my friends. And um, uh, of the same, of, of, of cosmetics and, and um, uh, personal uh, hygiene uh, products. And, uh, uh, but when I, when I finished my speech, then I was surrounded by a lot of people who were asking me more and more questions. And uh, one of them was saying, well, are you afraid of going back to Russia because you're so, uh, so anti-communist? I, and and I, if I would say no, I would probably be still in Moscow right now. Uh, but um, they said, well, do you have other options? And he said, yeah, sure, we'll look at the options. And I was not even thinking what options he's thinking about. And, and then I returned back home after all this this events and the nice uh, reception at at at, uh, at the Ministry of Finance uh, to, to find out that I need to call Walden Asap. I got a message from Hotel. Call Walden Asap. And I was thinking, Asap, uh, at, at that time I didn't know that it is as soon as possible. I thought this is a kind of an Iranian or Persian name. And uh, but I made a call, and uh, and uh, she said, "Well, let's go to Sweden tomorrow." And I was thinking, "Why to Sweden? Why tomorrow?" Looked at my appointment book, said, "No way, uh, I am all booked." And he said, um, uh, "So you cannot squeeze defection into your tight schedule." Oh. And only then I realized what he is talking about. And then I looked uh, through all my my schedule, and I said, "Friday." And he said, Friday, and he was laughing, Friday is a defection day. I said, uh, uh, yes, because I'm supposed to go back to Moscow. And instead of that, we can go to Sweden. And so we we went in a very James Bondish kind of way uh, through northern Finland, through Vasa, through Umea, Sweden, uh, ended up in the, uh, in the U.S. Embassy. Next morning, walked into the U.S. Embassy in Stockholm, asked for political asylum, and the Marine Guard said, okay, sir, but it's Saturday. Uh, the embassy is closed. Come back on Monday. Good grief. And I, yeah, and I was pretty scared because I was uh, I, I didn't have any Swedish papers. I had a Soviet diplomatic passport with expired Finnish visa. And uh, so uh, in our today's language, I was an uh, undocumented worker there. And and so I, uh, I, I said, no way I will get out of here. And he said, all right, then I will call officer on duty. Uh, who was probably a CIA officer, uh, but he was very nice. Uh, and uh, and then, to make long story short, and that nobody knew much about Perestroika, what is going on, so I was debriefed by all these governments, uh, by, by the governments of uh, Sweden and the United States and the United Kingdom and Germany. And um, and then I ended up in, in New York uh, at the end of the summer. Um, and that makes it kind of funny, because the customs officer, she said, I can you please open your your bag, and I and I knew what is there, and I was pretty much afraid. I opened it, and there was boxes of condoms, of lipstick, of mascara, 
And, uh, and she, she said, what is that for? Is that for private use or is that business samples or what? And even Soviet economists would say it's for private use. And so she took my diplomatic passport, which is a refugee stamp uh, on the top, and she looked at that and she said, huh, but you're coming for good. I said, yes. Uh, she said, I wouldn't let you in for a weekend trip with this stuff. And then she smiled ear to ear, and she said, welcome to the United States. Ah, how about so that? So that was very, very nice of her. Well, tell us about what your position was in the Soviet Union. What were you doing? What was your activity? You were an economist, but what were you doing as an economist? Yes. I was one of economic advisors to Mr. Gorbachev's government. I worked for the, for the Academy of Science and for the, for the something called Committee on Radical Economic Reform of the Council of Ministers and Academy of Science combined. I wasn't the advisor to Mr. Gorbachev. I wouldn't take the blame for what happened over there. Uh, moreover, I think that they, they collapsed so, so uh, dramatically because they were not listening to my advice. Uh, but what was my, my, my uh, job was immediate job. I was working on two different type of reforms. One was civil service reform. So I was supposed, together with, a, with another advisor who was a legal scholar, uh, to prepare a new law about uh, replacing nomenclatura. Maybe you heard about that. That was uh, civil, uh, I would say, very uncivil uh, disservice of the Soviet government. Uh, the, that means bureaucrats and party officials to replace them with something more civilized and to keep the numbers down and and to perform something which Mr. Gorbachev erroneously called democratization. So that was one field. And another field was conversion of the military uh, industries into civilian, into civilian uh, sector, into civilian sector, because uh, military economy was the backbone of the Soviet, of Soviet economy. I think it was a, at least 50% of everything was military, industrial, spy complex of the Soviet government. So that was both of these reforms to work with was, was very unpleasant and very difficult because there was such a resistance on behalf of bureaucrats, of Communist Party fanatics, and others. And even um, even uh, Mr. Rishkov, whom I worked with, who was Prime Minister of Soviet Union, he would, he would say, comrades, we need to change everything. And then he would sign and say, without touching anything. Mm. And so that that made me pretty frustrated with all this perestroika, and it really failed. It really failed. How is it possible that somebody like you, who never bought into the system, could get such a position? Was it the case that they didn't realize what your opinions were, or was it the case that everybody sort of knew that deep down everybody's an opponent of this system? That's right. Absolutely. Tom, you got it absolutely right. You got it, it much better than all the Soviet pathologists and Kremlinologists <laughs> in the Soviet <laughs> Union Thanks. ever realized. Yes. Because the people, I mean, it was some kind of like a social contract over there. Everybody knew that they are kind of in deep trouble. Uh, it was very difficult to believe in socialism in the Soviet Union when you have 11 time zones completely destroyed. When you have places like Ukraine with all this black dirt, the best black dirt in the world, starving. When you have, when, when, when even if you are a government, top government bureaucrat, uh, you have problems in finding a piece of soap or a piece of sausage. So that's, uh, that, that, that nobody liked it. Uh, even the people in the top, they were trying to save their positions, uh, but, but, they were looking desperately, looking uh, to do some kind of reforms. And what Mr. Gorbachev did, he he thought that that socialism is a great idea, but but it was perverted by Stalin, by Khrushchev. Uh, he still referred very reverently to Lenin, who was definitely a mass murderer number one. Uh, but he would um, he would um, uh, decry Stalin's. Uh, uh, purges and repressions as a, as, as a kind of a perversion of a humanistic side of socialism. And we were thinking, what is that humanistic side? Because why they were killing people um, uh, so, so, uh, so much? Because socialism does not have any incentives to do anything. So to force people to do something, uh, you need to apply mass murder. 
and treat people as their public slaves. And everybody was a government slave in the Soviet Union uh, to the extent uh, uh, unthinkable. Um, and so because of, because of that, uh, because of that, when Mr. Gorbachev was talking about human faith and whatnot, then he, was, he kind of withdrew fear out of the system, which was glued together only by fear. And that's why the Soviet Union collapsed so suddenly. If we have a minute, I can tell you a pretty funny joke about, about uh, this fear factor in the Soviet, in the Soviet uh, Union. Um, the, the joke is that the CIA didn't know what's happening, and they sent their best, uh, uh, best agent to the Soviet Union. And this agent is going from one store to another with a little notebook. And he goes to, to the butcher shop and writes in his notebook, no meat. He goes to the bakery and writes, no bread. He goes to the shoe store writing, no shoes. And there is a KGB guy following him. He looked over his shoulder and he said, 10 years ago, you will be shot. And he writes, there are no bullets. And that's exactly <laughs> when people realize there are no bullets anymore and everybody stopped working. That's how Soviet Union collapsed. Well, a lot of people think Gorbachev was a, a, a great humanitarian and he perceived the problems in the Soviet Union. But as you're, as you're putting it, in fact, he still believed in the ideals to which the country was supposed to be committed, but he thought that they had been carried out in the wrong way, they could be carried out more humanely, we need more openness in the society, we need glasnost. But apparently what happened is that as soon as you allow the openness, the whole thing mm -hmm. crumbles because it, it relies on being closed, it relies on lies, it relies on differences of opinion being suppressed. And then as soon as you open that up, the whole thing collapses. I mean, when, when Gorbachev started to say, I want people to feel more open, did people believe him, or did people still keep their mouths shut? The many people would still keep their mouths shut, because some people even thought that it will be like, uh, you remember maybe 1959, Mao Zedong had the policy, let the hundred flowers bloom. And so when they began to blossom, then they were all cut. And so some people thought that that would be... I was at a reception in Kremlin once, um, with, with, with talking to, to a, a KGB general in full uniform. And I said, well, during this period of openness, of perestroika, of glassness, what do you do? And he said, um, he said, we're taking names and phone numbers and addresses. I said, uh, for what reason? He said, just to be on the safe side for the future reference. <laughs> and so... So that means that that they probably it was very transitional society. Nobody knew. That's why people, many people, were still holding back because no, they didn't know. Maybe this Gorbachev, whom they would consider to be a clown in Kremlin, then maybe he would be killed or removed or something would happen to him. And then and then the 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 people like Andropov, like Putin, like others would take over, and Andropov was the chief of KGB, and they would apply mass murder again, especially to those people who were kind of, I would say, uh, spoke out. And, and so when the gene was out of the, uh, out of the bottle, uh, I think that that would be very difficult to get the gene back without mass repressions, because then, uh, then besides that, and I believe that that was one of the reasons, the major reasons, is that they found all these tens of millions of skeletons in their socialist cupboard. I mean, that they applied mass murder and such, that the, 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 the weight of these crimes and lies was unbearable, even for, uh, even for Mr. Gorbachev. When they found themselves that they murdered anywhere from 40 to 60 million people, uh, and um, uh, so that even for Mr. Gorbachev, it would be indefensible to say, uh, to say no, that was... At first, he was saying a mistake was made, like you kill 40 million people, oh, sorry, oops, mistake. Uh, so, so then he began to admit that there was horrendous crimes, and whatnot, and there is crimes, and then you have the pictures uh, everywhere, and the monuments to people who committed these crimes, then the whole, the whole country turned in some kind of a twilight zone. Now, not having lived in the Soviet Union myself, I don't know how to distinguish caricature from the real thing, but I've heard, anyway, that university life 
in the Soviet Union was quite interesting because there would be books that the general public could not read because they were opposed to Marxism or Marxism-Leninism, but a scholar could read them if it was necessary for his scholarly work in the pursuit of smashing the bourgeoisie around the world. If you were going to smash the capitalist powers and you needed to read their stuff to do it, then you could read it as long as you didn't disclose the contents to anybody else. Is that was that your experience? It was. It was. It was also, I would say, a bizarre experience because, um, uh, because uh, uh, again, my kind of gateway to ideas of freedom um, in a formal way. Well, I was thinking about freedom before even, and I was reading German philosophers, reading Adam Smith, and you know, anyone could could get that. I mean, Adam Smith was 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 published uh, almost everywhere. For what reason? They had a, a bizarre, also a bizarre approach to that. That everything before Karl Marx was great. For example, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, uh, Hegel, um, uh, they were all great uh, because Marx was reading them and became what he became. But everything after would be classified, would be put away from the people, would be prohibited for people to read. Why? Because if you already have Marxism, but you are not a Marxist, uh, then that means you are a, either a liar or an imbecile or, or, or a person who should be locked up, because uh, they, would, they would, officially they would say, well, truth is already discovered, so why would you have, uh, say, uh, to read uh, Hayek or von Mises, um, or even Keynes. So everything would be classified. But for me, this road to certain uh, experience was that I changed my major from history to history of national economy and history of economic thought. And so I got a letter from a dean of my college. I was at the Moscow State University. Uh, a very funny letter. I wish I would uh, have it here. I would, I would frame it. It said... Uh, uh, Comrade Maltsev is engaged in critique of the vulgar bourgeois political economy and should have access and uh, access to the materials um, and the topics were kind of put down they put put topics in uh, all um, economic thought uh, history uh, political economy uh, and then the dean signed it and this letter was addressed to Lenin's library which was uh, kind of like a version of library of congress in in moscow it's a big big, big the biggest library in the soviet union and so when you go there and i showed this and they told me that you take you take this this um, uh, elevator and you press the uh, the button with no numbers so I pressed the button and arrived, and there were two uh, pretty big police officer ladies with guns, and uh, they looked at my letter, and they uh, they led me to this room. With uh, The rooms were still poor. Uh, and then I signed uh, a lot of paperwork, and one, pa one paper I signed that I would never tell anyone what I'm reading here. Then... Uh, then also I was warned, that was very interesting, that I don't think many people in the West know about this, that that they would have they would open a dossier on me in which they would write down the, the titles of all books and magazines that I, that I requested to read. You definitely cannot take anything out of there. You only read there and uh, behind the steel doors. Uh, so, but also every, every material that I would request also would have a dossier with the names of people who read it. So, amazingly enough, that they would at least uh, try to frighten you, that they know what you read. And so if you would tell something, somebody, uh, then they can trace you to the book that you uh, came up with. And no, 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 like that. That was very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting and scary, because, for example, in 1938, for some reason, Stalin decided to kill everybody who was associated with uh, with um, uh, Georg Friedrich Hegel, a German philosopher. And so all Hegelians, all people who, whom he called Hegelians, were shot. All people who were criticizing Hegel were shot. All people who were teaching Hegel, which was impossible not to teach because Hegel was uh, kind of also a predecessor of Marx, 
and Marx wrote a lot about Hegel, and they also shot. So it was tens of thousands of people who were killed because they used the word Hegel uh, for this or that reason. I hardly know how to follow that up, but I I want to ask. I have two more because th- I I know we're limited on time. I have two more things I want to ask you though, so I want to jump right to them. I still see once in a great while somebody on the very hard left denying the sort of claims that you will see, especially among American conservatives, about consumption levels in the Soviet Union. A, a lot of anti-communists in the West would say that life was miserable just from a material standpoint in the Soviet Union because there was a lack of everything or everything was poor quality. You couldn't get things that you needed. And there are people on the hard left to this day who say that's all made up, that actually consumption levels were perfectly adequate and perhaps even comparable with the West. Is that just an outright lie? It is. It is. It is. And not on how it's right, like it's, it's, it's kind of, I would say, embarrassing lie. Uh, because I was, I worked for, my first job was with the Department of Labor of Soviet Union. And that's what I was studying, the standard of living. And I can just say, I, I think I even remember some facts. We, we can double check them, but I think I'm pretty good. The number of telephones, for example, the number of telephones per 100 households was 11. So you have 11 telephones per 100 households. The number of privately owned cars for 100 households was 1.6. Oh, my gosh. Yes. The number of refrigerators per 100 households was 40. It was pretty high. <laughs> the number of televisions uh, was 96, however, because they considered t- televisions as a propaganda thing. However, and it was, it was uh, 1988, however... Um, the number of colored televisions were 12 only. So <laughs> others were big, big black and white, uh, dusty kind of things with very little screens. So the, that would be, I mean, that was, they, for example, or what's amazing, they would, they would find out that in the United States, the consumption of meat, uh, of meat is about 110, I think, kilograms per year. And then they were thinking, and it was in my presence, uh, and that was maybe in 1975 or 76. And they were thinking, how we can show that we, because the Soviet Union was 28 kilograms. And so they, uh, they were thinking, what if we will combine? And they would say, meat and dairy products. So they would, they would put the numbers of milk together with meat, and say this is all meat and dairy products, and then yeah, they can come up with hundred kilograms. So, uh, so definitely we understand that one liter of milk uh, is nothing to compare with one li- with one kilogram of steak. Yeah. But that's what they would they would do. And then they will also, in many cases, the statistics were so perverted that they would have three different types of statistics. And only when I began to work for Gorbachev's government, I found out about it. I didn't know about that before. They would have, they would have open statistics, which would be published, uh, published in the, like, like a statistical abstract of the USSR. Uh, uh, then they would have a classified statistics. Classified. Uh, it's a secret, uh, secret statistics, uh, and that was statistics which they would think would leak out. Uh, so we okay. don't live so well as the official statistics are telling us, but we still live well enough as these classified statistics is telling us. However, they had the third books, third uh, type of books, which was top secret already statistics. Only very few had access to that. And that was telling us that there is almost nothing there. All right, that's what I figured had to be the case, but I, I wanted to run it by somebody who had experience living there and, and would be also familiar with the statistics. I, I'm going to let you go because we've, I've already kept you longer than I intended to. Even, I love talking to you, of course. But the next time we have you on, we'll talk about your book on the Tea Party, and then I want to get your thoughts on the current Russian leadership and the situation in Ukraine. I'm sure you have a unique perspective on that that we aren't likely to get through the rest of the U.S. media. So I appreciate your time, though, today so much, Yuri. This is, it's so important to record experiences of people like you 
so that we remember this, so that people are aware of it. I bet most American kids have no idea of the kind of experiences you just described. So thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. I just, uh, just before, before uh, I was on the phone with you, I had a macroeconomics class. And in macroeconomics class, well, on the bad side, almost nobody knew who Thomas Jefferson is, but nobody at all knew who Jimmy Carter was. <laughs> well, you know, okay, well, th- maybe there's some imp- improvement. You know, I, I used to say back in my old teaching days that I was consoled by the fact that they knew so little because it meant that there was less propaganda for me to undo. I'd rather have their heads be empty than have their heads be full of propaganda. If, if I had to choose, I'd rather start with a blank slate. All right, thanks again, Yuri. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It was great to talk to you. All right, everybody, that's Yuri Maltsev. Check out the Yuri Maltsev Fan Club on Facebook. We'll link to that in the show notes. Just type in Yuri Maltsev, M-A-L-T-S-E-V, and you can find that. Remember, we're celebrating two years of MyLibertyClassroom.com learning on the go with 50% off for a year's subscription. That's at LibertyClassroom.com with coupon code DISCOUNT in all caps. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking to Mark Perry about the subject of the male-female wage gap. Is there such a thing? If so, is it caused by sexism? We'll get to the bottom of that tomorrow. We'll see you then. The Tom Woods Show.